in the mountains. Far away from cities and towns is a place of healing, a place where the finest treatments and remedies are known to be made. In the mountains, far away from the sickness of souls and the suffering of humans is a place of knowledge, of deep understanding, a place where healers gather to tend to those in pain. In the mountains, far away from so much, is Gilead. Gilead was a real place. It was in the Transjordan region between Bashan and Moab. Today, we would just call it Jordan, east of the river of that same name. It was an area known for its concentration of powerful healers and potent ingredients, including balsam wood, which was used to make bombs, which is why the wood and balm share a common root. It was known for a special healing ointment made from the plants that grew in the mountainous region, and this hymn was written actually as an answer to an ancient question. In Jeremiah, in the Hebrew scriptures, the prophet asks, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of my poor people not been restored? The Reverend Kimberly Davis in, is the author of Notes from the Far Fringe, a website with her own take on each and every hymn that Unitarian Universalists sing. And Reverend Davis shares the wonder of this hymn as being an answer of sorts to this ancient question. Jeremiah asks, is there no bomb? And the hymn answers, there is a bomb. Now Jeremiah was a Jewish priest with a long and prestigious pedigree and training. He was unlike many of the other prophets of his age. He wrote roughly in the 620s before the Common Era, so BC. And the first record of this hymn we just heard was from 1854 or so of the Common Era. So even if it was alive and well before that, it took two millennia for someone to answer Jeremiah's question. Now, I don't care how faithful you are, that's a long, long time to wait for an answer, in my opinion. But Reverend Davis says something else about this hymn in her own opinion, something I confess as well, and something I see in the chat box here, I think, also. She says she sings this to herself all the time, but she never uses it in worship because so few Unitarian Universalists feel the message of the song resonates for them, namely that Jesus died to save us all. And I get that. I really do. Yeah, I can try and convince everyone that this powerful statement lies at the core of the theology practiced and preached by our universalist ancestors. And it was that all are saved, that hell has been conquered once and for all. And for some, that will carry the day. But for some, it really won't. For some of us, it feels, I don't know, kind of offensive to sing about sin and salvation in this way. And I get that. For some of us, that is just not the way we think about this vast universe. And both of those views are totally fine. See, our spiritual theme for September is promises. It's a fitting theme for a month, as you'll see in the coming weeks, because what better place is there than a church to talk about promises? As a Unitarian Universalist committee, we, or community, you, sometimes it feels like a committee, no. We don't have any creed or dogma that any person must ascribe to or agree with, sure. Communities like this one have ways of being together, and folks who choose not to be together in that way might not feel at home or part of this community, but we can't kick someone out for not agreeing with the belief or idea here. We can't withhold a blessing or a benefit from a member who believes differently. Now, the history of this movement of communities is one rooted in freedom, and promises like those don't do well for freedom. 
See, religion itself is simply a set of promises. The word religion literally means to bind together. And it comes to us from relig religare in Latin by way of the Old French. In truth, I don't really know what Old French means, but it sounds a little romantic and kind of sad. But it's open to interpretation to guess whether to bind means that those in a religion are bound to some kind of deity, or whether the people in that religion are bound to one another, or whether it's both. But there's so much power in being bound together in this way, and it leads to one of my favorite images of religion. So just go with me on this trip here, friends. Imagine we all decide to go camping. I know in these times, for this group, that's kind of a sad and long-ago memory, but maybe one will revive. But it's something I know many of us have done before. And on this trip, one of the things we're planning to do is build a big campfire solely for the purpose of making vegan s'mores. Sorry, I couldn't help it. Yes, we will also want to keep warm and be able to see one another's faces, tell stories, things like that, but mostly it's about the s'mores. So we get into our cars, we pack all we need to build the fire, right? There's newspaper, there's matches, and there's logs. But what is it that we don't bring as often? What's going to be there when we get there? Kindling, that's right. So we make camp before dusk, and a few of us start scouring the campsite for the little sticks or branches that have fallen to the ground. I personally like to pick up each stick in either one of my hands and just keep each stick in there, kind of hoovering them up, sort of building up and binding them together until I look like Edward Kindling hands, like this. And then when my hands get too full, I carry the mass of sticks back to the campsite. And as I look down at my hands, I can barely see where one stick or fallen branch begins and where the other one ends. My hands wrapped around them all near the approximate middle, create a puzzle that would be hard to unwind unless I dropped them all, all at once, and they fell apart again. So instead, I lay them gently by the fire pit in a big pile. Then when it's time, someone who will claim to have done some scouting or something like that will insist on building the perfect fire, and little by slowly, those printed words, that newspaper we brought with us, are wadded up and stuffed under the kindling. We light these pages and the fast flame from the fire flashes over the sticks and branches, still writhing together in a puzzle, and those flames from each of those sticks collected illuminate the larger logs, the big pieces we brought with us to warm us through the night. They illuminate our faces and give life to the stories we tell, and they warm our vegan s'mores. See, faith, religion, belief, those things that many of us have a hard time getting our hands around sometimes, are what we need between the texts, whether written or unwritten, that so many faiths depend on. The sources they draw from, even our own six sources, and the huge, big, beautiful, warming ideas we need to help us see one another fully, Things like compassion, justice, and joy for this community and many communities like it, or the eight principles of this faith, the real and important things in life. And many outside our faith and a growing number inside it wonder, how is it we are trying to illuminate the big issues, the big ideas, and really get them burning with only the paper of our sources to feed it? seems like there is something missing in between, right? Now the first chapter, and I do not think it is a mistake that it is the first chapter of the new book by the Commission on Institutional Change, Widening the Circle of Concern. This book that studied our faith movement and its hope for building an anti-racist, truly counter-oppressive movement for the past three years. The first chapter is about what? Theology. The book opens with the idea that as a movement, we must 
begin to take seriously the theology of our believers, of our non-believers, of each one of us, and of all of us. And I know many of you might think you know what theology is. You might think it means talk about God. And yeah, if you want to break down what that word means, maybe. But friends, that is not what theology is. Theology, friends, is a class in divinity school that makes you wish you stayed a lawyer forever. <laughs> no. Theology is more like a choose-your-own-way adventure or a maze, a puzzle, than it is like anything else. And it is one of the primary ways a person gets from a source of a faith, a text, a waterfall, a beautiful valley, a solstice, whatever your source is, to a major pillar or log of belief in the fire we are building. It's so much more than talking about God. It, in fact, some of the best theologies challenge that we might ever have a name for the divine or the merely incomprehensible at all. One way to look at theology is as the way that promises we believe that we put our faith in come true in our lives. Let's use music as an example. We love to sing hymns together. And what is a hymn? You have notes on a page. These are like a source or an indicator that something that might be nice to do or play or to sing, and when someone takes the notes and the rests, my choral conductors will always want me to mention the rests, and puts them together, you have the feeling of being moved or relaxed, or touched, or excited when the song is done. But what happened in the middle? An artist, a practitioner, a spirit, in our case, took a look at the notes on the page, worked her way through the song using the gorgeous instrument of her body with all the ways that the breath resonates, moves, and bounces. She felt deeply the meaning of the song and intuited where to elongate a phrase, where to breathe, where to end a note, where to rest, and in a beautiful bridge between the source and the final result she hoped to receive or to achieve. Make no mistake about it. The work she does in the middle is deeply satisfying at times, is deeply felt and powerful in and of itself. And doing the work of theology in the world is like that. It has a purpose, it is a challenge, but it must it must, it must not be for its own sake. Like music, it is meant to be lived. It is meant to be shared. And each one of you, each one of us all, my dear friends, is a theologian, whether you like it or not. Our good friend of the congregation, the Reverend Dr. Rosemary Bray McNatt, tells us that we are all public theologians, that we have the very source of life in us, the pages of each one of our books of life to draw from. And we have the ideals, the hopes, the promises we see that we want blazing through a society that is ripe for change, but between the pages, we etch in our days, and the ideals we hope to embody in the world are the ways we each hope to make those ideals real, the ways we live our lives in public, the promises we want to see kept in the world. Past co-president of the Unitarian Universalist Association and professor of theology, the Reverend Dr. Sophia Betancourt, in the theology chapter in Widening the Circle of Concern, shares this, her words. Our first principle, which is the upholding of the inherent worth and dignity of all human life, calls us to learn a language of resilience and liberation in response to the pain of the world we have inherited so that we might find wholeness and grace in our brokenness. A universalist theology of liberation in the present day centers our capacity to be sanctuary or radical truth-telling and abundant compassion so that the all-embracing love at the center of our tradition can serve to make us all more whole. And there it is. 
that hearkening back to that universalist idea right there in the center of that hymn, to make the wounded whole, to heal the sin-sick soul, to revive my soul again, to save us all high in the mountains, east of the stream that nourish the valley, is a group of healers who have found a way, a practice, a balm to ease the suffering so many have known for so long. Not in Gilead, friends, but here. Dr. Betancourt asks us all this question. I wonder what symbols, messages, principles, or experiences are most central to your deep understanding of Unitarian Universalism. World War II, the flaming chalice, promised protection on the journey toward freedom. What does this symbol offer to the liberation of those most driven to the margins of Unitarian Universalism today? And in her question, Dr. Betancourt is asking us each, what is our theology? What are the promises we hold out to those who join us here? Join us in church functions, join us perhaps in the checkout line, join us in traffic or heaven forbid these days in an elevator. What are the promises we are keeping to those in our midst about how we practice a faith, how we live a theology of revolutionary love that conquered death to bring a message that love cannot die? What are the promises we are keeping to those in our midst about how we practice a faith, how we live a theology of binding, of bonding together to face a world that threatens so many so often with so much? What are the promises we are keeping to those in our midst about how we practice a faith, how we live a theology of freedom, of real freedom, from the tyranny of assimilation by offering the blessing of liberation. And most importantly, what are the promises we are keeping to ourselves? How are we living a theology of love, of community, of freedom for ourselves? Because as important as any promise is that we make to anybody else, there is no more important promise to keep than the one we make to ourselves. Anyone who breaks a promise to themselves gets no vegan s'mores. And there's our friend Jeremiah, out in the wilderness of 600 BC. Well, he got his answer in the beautiful song we heard. And he probably got a, a nicer answer than he deserved. You see, the questions he asked, is there a bomb in Gilead? Is there a physician there? Are the last lines of a sort of song or poem that he wrote? The title of his song was the blind perversity of the whole nation. That's a pretty metal title for 600 BC. And maybe Jeremiah was ahead of his time, but more likely, he was a person very much of his time and seems to be a person of all times who might behold a leader with their own best interest in heart, who might behold a land under siege from elements that might have been avoided, who beholds the pulling apart at the seams of some of the basic fabric of a nation, of a people, of a community. And so he might call his song the blind perversity of the whole nation indeed. But in a song so sweet, we hear the answer. We feel the warmth of a, of a flame lit centuries ago and tended today here in these mountains, and not so alone as we once were, as we answer the ancient questions, as we kindle the ancient flame, as we sing the old songs to each other around our fire, where all that makes the fire go shows each of us in our own way, coming together as we do 
and leaning into those promises we made. Leaning into the promises we keep to one another and to ourselves. And leaning into love. Always leaning into the warm shoulder of love. May it ever be so. Blessed be. And amen.